Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we take you to the heart of downtown Calgary, where this past weekend, a significant event unfolded at this year's Federation of Canadian Municipalities Convention. The convention, a pivotal gathering for municipal leaders from across the nation, had a speech from Perry Sound Muskoka MP and Conservative Party of Canada housing critic, Scott Aitchison. As hundreds of municipal leaders, city planners, and local government officials gathered in the bustling conference halls at the TELUS Convention Center, Aitchison pitched the delegates the conservative vision of Canada if the party was to win the next general election. Hello. I want to thank the FCM and all you uh, amazing members for inviting me to the great city of Calgary. I love it here. I'm sure you're all having a great time. Many of you will actually be quite familiar with the region that I represent in the House of Commons. Perry Sound Muskoka is famous for the rugged rocky shores of Georgian Bay and the thick expanse of forests dotted by lakes, uh, many of them, of course, surrounded by very expensive vac vacation homes. The region is quite often seen as a playground for the rich, and it is. It's also a community of communities, though, and it's a place where there are a lot of hardworking folks just trying to make a living. And a lot of those jobs in the region are seasonal, somewhat precarious. The median income in my community is 20% below the provincial average of Ontario. And so adequate housing in my riding like the rest of Canada, has become a pipe dream. This really isn't normal in Canada. Uh, we used to have a deal in this country. You worked hard, you picked up a trade, a degree, you saved, and you saved. And it wasn't necessarily easy, but a home at the end of the road was going to be waiting for you. It was possible. That was the deal. But after nine years of Trudeau's plans, rent has doubled, mortgage payments have doubled, and that promise feels broken for a whole generation of Canadians. Nurses and carpenters are living in their cars because even a regular job doesn't cut it anymore to support the cost of living increases. We see young people who are unable to live in the neighborhoods they grew up in, and middle-class Canadians who now struggle to pay their mortgages. And of course, the most vulnerable in our society are relegated to shelters and street corners. And I don't need to tell any of you about tent cities that aren't just in big cities anymore. They're everywhere. They're popping up in every municipality. And for buying a home, it's a whole generation that's just given up on that. Today, we're at a point, Canada, where the biggest factor that determines whether you can buy a home is not the job you have. It's not the income you make. It's not the degree you've earned. It's certainly not the dirt in your boots or the calluses on your hands, but it's how rich your parents are. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that. According to the RBC, it now takes 70.2% of median household income to make payments on the average single-family home's mortgage. The Fraser Institute's points out that taxes now consume more than 45% of household income for the average Canadian family. Now, I'm no mathematician, and I'm sure there's not a lot of them in the room, but it doesn't take really difficult math to realize that this, these numbers just don't add up. And that's just for the basic necessities. We're not, we're not talking about getting ahead here. We're talking about just you know, paying for the basics. It never used to be that way. For decades, that promise that I mentioned earlier, it worked, it held up. We could make it work. So how do we get here? There are many problems. There are many reasons for the housing crisis we face, and it's been growing for years. And I know that also the nine years of inflationary spending and constantly increasing carbon tax, I hope when the Prime Minister is here, you ask him how much the carbon tax has added to the cost of municipal projects and how much more it costs to build homes. This doubling of the national debt, it's all making everything more expensive, and it's making it bad to build. Provincial land use guidelines have not really kept up with rapid growth. And municipal red tape keeps many new projects on paper instead of in the ground. Government at every single level makes housing more expensive. 
In Canada's two most populous provinces, government taxes, charges, fees, they all add over 30% to the cost of every single unit of housing. So the truth is, no one, no one makes more money on housing than governments. To put this into context, in Canada, we tax housing kind of at the same rate we tax cigarettes and booze. You know how we used to call those the sin taxes? Really shouldn't be a sin to live in a home of your own. The Trudeau government has talked a lot about housing. We just heard Minister Fraser here, and uh, it's all very positive. Back in 2017, they announced their housing strategy, the National Housing Plan. He stood in front of, Prime Minister Trudeau stood in front of a big construction project, lots of workers around him, and, and announced uh, this, what he called, life-changing, transformational national housing strategy. Well, that transformation five years later has doubled home prices, doubled rent. Millions of Canadians who are headed to the bank this year, well, they're not sure if they can afford their home anymore. This past summer, the Prime Minister announced a whole new plan for housing. This one was going to be the most ambitious plan ever. Many of you are familiar with one of the elements of that plan, the Housing Accelerator Fund. This is a $4 billion fund doled out to cities based on agreements that those cities will speed up the development process. Many cities represented here today have gotten those deals and gotten some money out of that process. Some cities uh, in their plans have planned to hire more planning staff. Most have agreed to Minister Fraser's sort of key demand, it seems, for most of them to permit four residential units as of right in any residential zone. Uh, he seems to believe, I guess, that this fourplex idea is going to make some kind of a silver bullet kind of difference, despite, you know, the evidence that does exist already. The City of Toronto has permitted fourplexes now for just over a year, for about a year. Uh, in that time, they've received, I think, about 74 applications to make the transition. So, you know, it's not a silver bullet. Inexplicably, this $4 billion taxpayer fund has zero requirements to reduce the cost of government in getting more homes built. And let's be honest, any program that tries to make housing more affordable but doesn't tackle the 30% cost of government in home building is doomed to fail. So let's just look at how the Liberal plan has worked. I'll give you a couple of examples. The City of Toronto, they've received almost a half a billion dollars, 471 million. And then they turned around and increased development charges on single family homes from 97,000 to 117,000. That's an increase of over 20%. I was picking on the city of Ottawa, I had a meeting with the mayor this morning to talk about it some more, but the city of Ottawa received $178 million in housing accelerator funds. They proposed a 28% increase in development charges, though they did generously reduce that to an 11% increase. The city of Winnipeg is another example of the city, received $122 million, and then they denied approval of a plan to build 1,900 homes next to a transit station on lands obtained from the city for housing. It is perverse to me that the federal government would give tax dollars to cities to help build more homes only to see those cities make it more expensive to build more homes. I say that's similar to what uh, former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley called driving a car with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake at the same time. Doesn't really work. And cities are too slow to approve new housing. Canada is 34th out of 35 OECD comparator nations to approve building permits. On average, it takes 249 days to get a building permit approved in Canada, compared to an average of 81 days in the United States. The CMHC reports that we need to build almost 6 million homes by 2031 just to, restore for, or just to restore affordability, to restore that promise of opportunity, to restore the dream of home ownership that a generation of Canadians are currently locked out of. And so the current Liberal plan amounts, in my estimation, to not much more than photo ops to announce pay for promises fund. So what's the solution? Well, I'm happy to report that when Pierre Polyev is Prime Minister, we will take a different approach. And I promise, 
We will do our part at the federal level. First, we will fix the fiscal mess of money printing, excessive borrowing by the Trudeau government, which has caused inflation and a spike in interest rate and continued uncertainty in the markets. Second, we will ax the carbon tax that makes everything more expensive, including materials for home building. And we will also cut the wasteful spending, like $20 billion in consultants, the multi-million dollar rise scam, among all the other little projects. Things like these sole source contracts for liberal insiders, the $30 billion infrastructure bank that has yet to build any infrastructure. And I promise, we will reform the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation from an institution of paperwork, bureaucracy, process and delays to the Get Homes Built Corporation. And we'll do that by putting excessive bonuses and salaries on the line until we meet a 60-day response for municipal applications. And we will be there to help cities as well. We will help you reduce the local cost of building and the all too painfully slow process of getting approvals on subway projects, LRT projects, you know, rapid bus routes and other transit projects, we will require, we won't ask nicely, we won't beg, we will require that the land around those projects for high density transit will be zoned and ready to go for high density residential before federal money flows to the projects. Targets for housing will be set. And if cities are beating their targets, they will be rewarded and they will love a Pierre Polyev Prime Minister. Cities that make it more expensive or miss their housing completion targets will lose federal transfers. And I'll tell you, we don't need to tell you what to build. You know that. We don't need to dictate from Ottawa how cities should use your local planning tools to speed up the process and get the job done. You know that too. So do it and reap the rewards of a federal infrastructure money in the thriving communities that new homes bring and the opportunity and prosperity for all generations. Don't do it, and you won't receive any federal transfers. There'll be no more federal transfers for well-written staff reports full of great ambition on housing. There'll be no more federal transfers for cities that increase the cost to build homes. There'll be no more federal transfers to cities that don't meet their targets. Pierre Polyev government will reward results, full stop. And we invite municipal leaders to join us as we form a new conservative government, hopefully very soon, to reduce the burden of government at all levels, weighing down our economy, making it too expensive for Canadians, and frankly, stealing the dream of home ownership from a whole generation. Cities and towns in every part of Canada are on the front lines of the housing crisis, but they're also absolutely crucial to the solution of the housing crisis. The hopes and dreams of young people depend on it. The promise of Canada is slipping away from them, and we cannot wait any longer. The next generation are depending on us. The next generation of Canadians are depending on you. Our future depends on you. And we will work together to get the job done, build the homes that Canadians need, and get this country moving again. Thank you very much. Now, before we let you go, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities for allowing us to attend this year's convention here in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. This episode would not have been possible without their support. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now, wherever you're watching this or listening to this. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs from coast to coast to coast. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.